of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <laughs> welcome to worship on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. A special welcome to those of you who might be worshiping with us for the first time or for the first time in a long time. It's good for us to be here. A couple of announcements before we get started this morning. The first one, you need to take out a pen or pencil. I'll wait. <laughs> uh-huh. And then you need to take out your bulletin and turn to the last page and change the closing hymn number. <laughs> the closing hymn is number 840. You can see what we did there, right? The closing hymn is 840. And if I don't tell you now, I will forget to tell you later. So thank you. And as long as you have your bulletins out, you can look at the back page and notice that there is a call for singers. We have the men and women's chorus coming back this summer. It is a great opportunity for those of you who are in the choir and like to sing, but for those of you who maybe aren't generally in the year-round choir but are looking for that opportunity to sing with a group this summer. There'll be a men's and women's chorus with rehearsals coming up over the next couple of weeks, so you are all invited to join in that. I did notice that you can be all the way up to 200 years old to join that <laughs> choir, so that means you all qualify, unless there's something I don't know, but I think we're, I think we're good, right? Um, what else do we have going on? Today's the last day to order tickets for the Colorado Rockies Faith Day. Their baseball game is going to be Sunday, August 14th at 1.10. We'll have a carpool leaving the church at 11 a.m., so you all are safe. You get to come to your regular church service and then go to the baseball game if you want to. Again, today is the last day to, order the, for, to sign up to have tickets ordered. You can do that on either the church app or out at the welcome desk. Somebody would be happy to help you. Um, I arrived back from San Francisco late last, e very late last evening, maybe even early this morning, um, to, after spending a couple days with the kids out there. I brought my own youngest out and we caught up with our kids in San Francisco. They had a fantastic time. They have been, they did service projects the first couple days they were there. Um, they've done some sightseeing the second couple days and they are currently waiting for a delayed flight to come back home. <laughs> Right, so such is travel in this summer, I understand. Um, if any of you are planning to come and retrieve a child from that trip, it's going to be closer to 6.30 or 7 tonight instead of, say, 12.30 or 1 this afternoon. Um, look for an email from Shelly on that. But the kids had a fantastic time, and I think they just want to express their thanks and gratitude for the support that has come from the congregation for that. On that same note, um, thanks... Thanksgiving to the congregation for that pile of stuff out there for One Nation Walking. We'll be continuing to collect supplies just for one more week. So if you have anything you want to bring in this week um, for the One Nation Walking drive, you can go ahead and do that anytime throughout the week or even next Sunday. In the life of the church this week, we'll have a memorial service on Wednesday, that's July 27th, for Eleanor Helmstead at 1 o'clock here in our sanctuary. That is a memorial service for Eleanor Helmstead at 1 o'clock in the sanctuary here on Wednesday. And then further, further down in August, on Friday, August 12th at 1 o'clock, we'll have a memorial service for Mary Hansen here in the sanctuary. And we'll let you know again in the week before that happens. I have no other announcements this morning, so let us continue worship with our confession of sin and assurance of forgiveness. Please stand as you are able. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We take a moment for silent confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning may be found in your bulletin. us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you gladly give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us your abundant mercy. Forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience, and give us those good things that come only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I get to share a children's message this morning. It's been a while. So if we have any children, I just saw a few walk in. I invite you to come up here and hang out with me for a minute or two. It's like you guys hide in the pews. All of a sudden, little heads pop up and they start coming towards the middle. I never know where you guys are going to be. Come sit down. So today, oh, today, one of the things that we're going to talk about is our gospel reading. So our gospel reading is part of Jesus' story. And today, Jesus teaches, well, Jesus teaches a lot, all the time, but today he's going to teach the disciples how it is to pray. What are some things that people have had to teach you? or you just know how to do everything. My kids think they know how to do everything, right? It's like they ne we never have to teach them. You have to go to school, right? They teach you how to spell things, and they teach you how to do math problems. You get taught all sorts of things at school. Where else do you have to be taught how to do something? I have cookbooks. 
My cookbooks teach me all sorts of things when I follow the directions like I'm supposed to, <laughs> which sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. So today, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Do you guys pray? Do you know how to pray? Look, you've got this right. Yeah? I was going to say we got that down. Well, what is it that, why did the disciples need Jesus to teach them? Because sometimes we have to learn these things, right? I mean, Jesus would be the one to know, wouldn't he? I mean, he'd kind of be the expert in the whole prayer thing. So it makes sense to me. So he was talking with all of his disciples, and they wanted to know, like, what do you talk about God with? What would you, what are some things that you might need to talk to God about? You guys are really quiet this morning. You're killing me. <laughs> well, I talk to God about all sorts of things, right? I talk to God when I need things or when I want to say thank you for things or sometimes if I want to pray for other people because I think maybe they need something or I want to be thankful for things that other people have done to me. So one of the ways that we do that, right, is talking to God. Do you know that God or that Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer? So they kind of got close to him and they folded their hands and then nobody said anything. That happens sometimes, right? Get a group of people together and say, I need somebody to pray. And everybody folds their hands and looks down and nobody says anything. That's when, that's when the pastor card comes in handy, right? It's like, I got this. I can, I can do it. So they didn't want that to happen. So they folded their hands, they looked down, and finally one of them said, what should we say? What should we say? And Jesus said, why don't you start with our Father in heaven? And then we can thank God for the good things in our life, for all the good things that come from God. How about thanks for our family, or thanks for our teachers, or somebody might have asked, can you thank God for God? I don't know, I think so, right? We should be able to say thanks to God just for being God. Do you know what we call that? That's giving praise to God. That's what we do in church on Sunday mornings. We come here, we give thanks to God, and we praise God. And when we praise God, that's thanking God for being God. And we ask for our daily needs, for our daily bread, for the things that we might need to get us through the day, and we ask for forgiveness all those different things. When you guys come back after Sunday school today, I want you to listen for that Lord's Prayer and all the things that we ask for and that we give thanks for in that prayer and see if maybe those are things that you could ask for and give thanks for every day. I bet they probably are. Will you pray with me now? Right, it's this and put the heads down. I'll do the praying. <laughs> Dear God, we thank you for all that you have given us and all that you have blessed us with. We give thanks for this time together where we can learn more about each other and we can learn more about you. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for coming up this morning. For sure, use all your noise on Miss Linda since you were so quiet for me, right? <laughs> all right, you guys can go with Miss Linda and we'll see you back here afterwards. A reading this morning may be found on page 956 in your Black Pew Bible. A reading from Galatians. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. 
And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with his legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. The word of the Lord. We continue with the psalm. We will read it responsibly. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down for your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name. And On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. For great is the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the word of your hands. We stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, peace, and mercy to you from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Today's text is a good one, but I think the parable is likely the most skipped over portion of the whole reading. The reading itself is really divided into three different parts. First, with the disciples wanting Jesus to teach them to pray. And then, with Jesus telling the parable of the friend at midnight. And finally, with Jesus telling them to ask for what it is that they might need. And really ending with a second parable, asking about giving a child a fish versus a snake. The Gospel invites us to reflect on a story of prayer and what it means for us to have a meaningful prayer life that directs our journey with God. So as we wander through this story, I invite you to think of those who have taught you to pray. 
or perhaps those whom you have taught to pray, those who have shared with you what their life of prayer has meant to them and what that looks like, and to think about our own journey with prayer, why it is that it makes us nervous to pray sometimes, certainly in front of other people, or keeps us from fully trusting in the prayers that we offer and in what it is that we receive back. And here, I will help to get you off the hook right from the start. We're always looking to grow in our prayer, and sometimes growth is hard, right? Prayer doesn't have to be long or wordy or eloquent or beautiful. At best, it should be heartfelt and meaningful. I will tell you, when I first got here, and it was Pastor Peel and Pastor Mark and I, they learned very quickly that at meals, you wanted me to pray because I am the short and fast prayer. (laughs) It got us to the food much more quickly than if we had given that privilege to someone else, right? Famous author Anne Lamott would tell you that the simplest prayer is to simply say, help me, help me. Or in another version would be to say, thank you. Thank you. So, next time you are put on the spot to pray, right, let us pray. Thank you. Amen. (laughs) No? (laughs) All right. For you, that will work. (laughs) I think you could probably do that. We can all get on board with those. And beyond that, We should seek the words that Jesus taught us in this text when his disciples wanted to know how to pray. The Lord's Prayer certainly covers everything that we might want to say in prayer, both in terms of thanksgiving and forgiveness and what it is that we might need. And lastly, we can take comfort knowing that even when we have no words to pray on our own, it is with sighs that are too deep for words that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. To begin today's text, Jesus invites his disciples to be brave in approaching God, who is already close to them. Jesus supports his teaching with the two parables, the parable of the insistent friend at midnight, which isn't found in Matthew with the other teaching of the Lord's Prayer, and then this parable of the invitation to ask for what it is that you need. The common theme between the parable of the insistent friend and the Lord's Prayer is this concept of prayer and repeated references to bread being filled with what we need, whether it is by words of praise and thanksgiving and by the bread of life that is both bread in terms of hospitality that we share with one another and is the bread of life that comes to us as Jesus. This parable encourages the disciples to persist in their plea to God. What motivates a person in need to appeal to his friend at night to give him a loaf of bread is their friendship, right? The man isn't going to a stranger's house and asking for a loaf of bread at midnight. He is going to his friend and he is knocking on the door and he is asking, what can you, can you supply this with me? I need to be hospitable to my neighbor, and I'm asking you to share that hospitality with me first. The bond that connects the disciples with God is more vital than friendship. It's familial. It's an intimate relationship. It's the relationship that invites the believers to persist in prayer. The parable that follows the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, when I first read it, this friend at midnight, is a little bit humorous and potentially problematic. You don't really know how somebody is going to answer their door. In an ancient culture, without instantaneous communication, without all-night grocery stores, it's not difficult to imagine being surprised by the arrival of an unexpected guest and caught without supplies that are needed for even basic hospitality. If somebody came to my door at midnight today, I'm not answering it. Right? You know what I'm doing first? I'm getting out my phone. 
I'm looking at the camera app that I have at my front door, and I'm going to see who's standing there long before I get close to the door. And I suspect that probably half of you would do the same. Look at the ring camera, look at the security camera, and see who's at the front door. That being said, I can't imagine somebody coming to my door and asking for bread either. The last time somebody came to my door at 11.30 at night after going through the whole process of figuring out who it was, it was my neighbor to tell me that my garage door was open. <laughs> Which was very kind of them, for sure. And of course, right, but my initial feeling was that of fear. What are they knocking on my door for? And it was an act of hospitality and community. So it is surprising somehow. It was surprising, right, to have somebody at the front door and the picture that is painted for us is one of abandoning all concern for decorum or for personal dignity and trying to rouse the sleeping neighbor to help, right? They went des in desperate times, seeking desperate measures. I need this from you so I can show hospitality to the person who is coming to me. I think all the kids left, right, mostly. I always have to ask if I'm going to talk about like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or any of our any of our friends, right? So when we hit COVID in March of 2020, it was about three or four weeks before Easter, and I have a group text with all of my girlfriends, and none of us were shopping, right? Nobody was running to Target to grab things or running to Costco to pick up a bag of this or a bag of that. So it got to be the day before Easter, and one of my girlfriends sent a very frantic text and said, we don't have any Easter candy. And I went, I got you. I have all the Easter candy, because I buy it as soon as it comes out and eat it all the way until Easter, <laughs> right? And I know enough to buy far more than I need so I can eat as much as I want and not have to worry about it the night before Easter, right? So. We went on a mission, a covert mission, to deliver the Easter candy in an unseen sort of way, quiet, along the side of the house, in the dark, because desperate times call for desperate measures so we can show the hospitality that we need to, whether it's in our with our friends or with our family. The temptation here is to interpret this parable as an indication that God, too, needs cajoling, that maybe he needs poking, or at least, at least that that hallmark of Christian prayer is persistent, right? That we get what we need when we push a little bit, when we remind, when we constantly tell them, this is what I need. The Greek word, anadea, is best translated not as persistence in this reading, when speaking of persistence in prayer, but is actually better translated as shamelessness. It implies a boldness that comes from familiarity, right? We can be shameless in our asking if we're comfortable in who we're doing the asking with, or if we are just beside ourselves in our need. The parable's breadless host asks only once, making bold to count on his neighbor's conformity to the duties of hospitality. He is, in this sense, shameless counting on his friend's desire to not fail communal expectations. See, also, Jesus intimates, should we make bold to offer our petitions to God, shamelessly calling on God to keep God's promises? Sometimes I wonder, do we really need to call out to God and cajole him into keeping his promises? In a commentary written by the professor of New Testament at Lutheran and Southern Cemetery, Cemetery, Seminary, <laughs> he interprets this passage, particularly this work, as saying the persistence reading of the parable may imply that God is reluctant or unaware and needing to be roused by our prayers before God will do anything. It may imply that prayer is the means by which we harass God until God finally submits to doing what it is that we want. But the notion that repeatedly we must bang on the doors of heaven if we are to catch God's attention is hardly an appropriate theology of prayer. I think shamelessness may come before persistence 
in seeking what it is that God wants us to come to him for. The better option for translating that word is shameless, a lack of sensitivity to what is proper, a willful lack of concern about acquiring any public shame. It's a meaning that's used only once other time in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where it's placed in parallel with disgrace. The question then becomes, whose shamelessness is the reason for the sleeper to get up and give what is requested? Is the petitioner shameless for begging in the middle of the night? Or would the sleeper be shameless for not getting up to help? Either is possible, and either still seems fraught with theological trouble. If the former, then the parable calls us to be shameless in our approach to God which hardly seems better than treating the parable as a lesson about our persistence. In the end, do we really want to trust in the character of our prayers, whether persistent or shameless? If the shamelessness is instead attached to the sleeper, what does it say about God? Is this what hallowed be your name really means, that God will act only out of potential shame if the prayer is to be ignored? Sometimes there's a, there's a helpful suggestion about this parable and its dynamic of shame that comes from another theologian. The petitioner indeed acts with shameless disregard of his neighbor and perhaps the others who he may have woken up as he was banging on the door. But the focus quickly shifts to the one in bed. Though the petitioner acts in a shameful way, his neighbor deals with the shame in a way that will bring honor to both of them. Perhaps that's the better way to view what hallowed by your name means. God will act to honor God's name even when we act in dishonorable ways. Final piece of this text is another direction of how it is that we should pray. The prayer serves as an affirmation of the worldview Jesus teaches and embodies suggesting how the good news might be made manifest in us. If we ask, if we seek, and if we knock, Jesus says, we will surely receive and find the door will be opened for us to the Father's favorite and fundamental gift, which makes possible the prayer's fulfillment. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift that resides and dwells within each one of us, the gift that we have already been given is the Father's favorite gift to us the one that knows our prayers when we don't, the one who is on our lips when we don't know what words to use. The Holy Father wants us to knock and find the Spirit waiting to enliven and feed and defend us. The point of prayer is not to change God's mind, but to shape ours, to make us fit for the kingdom ready to live the only life possible in God's household, which is one of love. Prayer doesn't need to be hard or magnificent or full of words that sound perfect and churchy. God hears all our words, even and especially those that are unspoken. We are simply pushing against an open door when we pray. So I invite you to be shameless in your prayer, in your relationship with God, in asking for what it is that you need. Perhaps it's not about persistence so much as coming to God fully vulnerable as disciples who want to grow and to learn. This past Thursday night in San Francisco, I joined all of our kids and adults who are out there doing, doing their mission work and doing some... Um, faith formation. Thursday night, we joined what is called the San Francisco Open Cathedral. And it's worship service that is put on by a consortium of preachers and congregations. And it's held at the 16th and Mission Street BART Plaza. It's the subway. So you come up out of the BART, the subway, and you land at 16th and Mission. It's not a nice part of town it's safe to say. When you come out, it smells. There's a lot of noise, not all of it friendly. There are a lot of people that look nothing like anybody here does who come out to the 16th Street Mission Station. And together, we meet there for worship. 
So we came up, and there's folding chairs all over the plaza, and there are a couple of pastors there who do street ministry, mostly as their call. And together, at 5.30, we began by singing Amazing Grace. There are no song sheets. There was a bulletin. I will say there was a bulletin there. There was a guitar player who was supposed to be there, but got stuck in traffic on the way. And we began worship with the liturgy just as we did here this morning. We had a greeting. We confessed our sins. We sang, we sang the same songs that we sing here, all from memory. We shared a meal together. We talked with one another. We had fellowship when it was all over. And I think the experience for each of us who was there is that we can worship together. We can recognize this liturgy that has been with us for thousands of years and these prayers that we say in the language that is familiar to us, in the words that are familiar to us, to one God who is the same to all of us, despite our differences, despite how we look or how we come, because in front of God, all of us are shameless. We are vulnerable, but we carry no shame coming to God and offering our prayer. Shameless as we come to God in prayer. Shameless as we ask for help. Shameless when we want to offer good hospitality and need others to show it to us first. Shameless in our prayer because it's not to change God's mind but to shape ours. Shameless as we learn to pray together. Shameless in who we are, how we gather, and how we pray. So it is my hope that together we pray boldly and bring ourselves before God asking and seeking and knocking without shame, knowing that God is with you and for you no matter what. Amen. I invite you to please stand as we join in our hymn of the day that you can find in your bulletin. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of life, and the life of the last day. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come before God boldly in prayer. Rooted and built up in Christ, we pray for the church, embolden church leaders to take risks for the sake of the gospel, and equip the bad pies to proclaim your extravagant love for the whole world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the works of your hands, we pray for your creation. Let us be good stewards of all that you have given us. Help us to protect our natural resources and use them in ways that are sustainable for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Interceding on behalf of the vulnerable, we pray for the peoples of the world. Inspire all rulers and governing authorities with your justice. Guide the work of legislatures and public officials that they advocate for the well-being of those they serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shameless in our prayer, we pray for our neighbors in need. To all who have hunger, give daily bread. To all who have bread, give hunger for justice. Open us to the cries of those who suffer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Abounding in thanksgiving, we pray for this congregation. Bless the prayer and fellowship ministries in this place. Call us together in times of praise and blessing, trouble and sorrow, in your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised with him to new life, we give thanks for your saints who rest in your eternal presence. Join our voices with theirs as we sing of your great glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, Lord, in your mercy, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please turn and greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As a reminder, this is Christ's table. All are welcome to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you need gluten-free bread, you can receive that from the ushers as you come forward. There's always white grape juice available in the center of the communion trays. Again, this is Christ's table, and all are welcome. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. Thanks be to God.
stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live with others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 840. Now thank we all our God. peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.